the question of the nature of reality is an important one, not least existentially, since it is closely tied to the question of the meaning of life. The most widely accepted metaphysical position today is physicalism, the view that everything in existence is reducible to the physical. But arguably, physicalism is less well grounded than many people, including many academics perhaps, usually assume. Most importantly, physicalism seems unable to adequately explain the existence and the nature of consciousness. This video is going to outline an alternative theoretical model for the fundamental nature of reality, a model that is idealistic in nature and that seems to avoid the problems many other models face and thus shows a greater degree of explanatory power. Traditional alternatives to physicalism include substance dualism, the view that both the physical and the mental are ontologically fundamental. Double aspect theory, which claims that the physical and the mental are two aspects of one underlying substance and idealism, according to which it is the mental that is fundamental, or at least more fundamental than the physical. That is, that the physical world does not exist independently of consciousness. All of these positions face particular and serious challenges, but that's a topic for another video. So we can assume to begin with that none is better off than the others. In this video, the focus is on idealism, because it seems to offer us explanatory potential when we use the framework of the idealistic position to ask what the nature of reality is. Epistemological idealism claims that everything we can know is dependent on mind in some way. But what we are interested in in this video is metaphysical idealism. We are not asking what we can know about the world, we are asking about the world, what the world actually is, about the fundamental nature of reality. Traditionally, there are two strands of metaphysical idealism. Berkeley's subjective idealism, or immaterialism, says that only minds possess any real or substantive existence. The physical or external world does not. It consists merely of ideas. It exists only as perceptions. And then there is absolute idealism. It claims that the external world does exist independently, but that in reality the world is a single unified absolute while what seems to be the physical world consists of appearances of this absolute. Both strands were heavily criticized by G. E. Moore and Bertrand Russell at the beginning of the 20th century, and at the time they were successful. Moore mainly criticized subjective idealism, and Russell mainly attacked absolute idealism. So, while metaphysical idealism has been advocated occasionally by Timothy Sprigg, for example, the position has largely been absent from the philosophical debates of the last hundred years. Or so. Russell's refutation of absolute idealism has been questioned by present-day scholars, however, and thus conventional arguments against absolute idealism appear to be significantly less well-founded than they are usually assumed to be. Since materialism seems unable to treat the problem of consciousness adequately, we have strong reasons to explore alternatives to materialism or physicalism. I'll, I'll outline why absolute idealism is a 
promising position that seems to have a lot of explanatory power. Physicalism's failure to solve the problem of consciousness has pushed philosophical research down new avenues in the last decade or two. One of those has been a renewed interest in the thesis of panpsychism. This is the view that consciousness is both ubiquitous and fundamental, or at least not reducible to the physical. Often the idea is that the fundamental units of the physical, assuming the physical has fundamental units, possess consciousness of some perhaps very rudimentary kind. These then combine and the result is the human mind and animal minds in general, all constituted by these micro-consciousnesses. However, this leads to a difficulty, the combination problem. How can these micro-subjects be combined into a larger subject, such as the human subject? How can individual perspectives combine into a single unified perspective? In an attempt to circumvent this difficult problem, a debate on cosmopsychism has emerged in recent years. Cosmopsychism is the view that the cosmos as a whole possesses consciousness. We can understand it like this. It's not that micro-minds constitute the subject's consciousness. It's that there's one cosmic consciousness that constitutes the whole range of consciousnesses like ours. So the combination problem is avoided. This strand of cosmopsychism, however, is confronted with the combination problem in its inverse form, the so-called decombination problem. What explains the division or the differentiation of the cosmic consciousness into individual minds? How can there be individual subjects if there is one all-embracing consciousness? Suggestions attempting to handle this problem have been proposed, but that debate is outside our scope. Yet another topic for a different video. Suffice to say, there is currently no universally accepted theory of cosmopsychism, and the debate on cosmopsychism is by no means settled. In the following, I'll present a non constitutive variant of cosmopsychism, designed precisely to avoid decombination. We avoid the problem of explaining the differentiation of the universal consciousness into individual minds because we do not posit that the universal or cosmic consciousness is constitutive of the totality of individual consciousnesses. As already suggested, the starting point here is absolute idealism, a position that has been advocated a number of times uh, in various forms during the history of philosophy. As a strand of idealism, it does not accept the physical as ontologically fundamental. Nevertheless, it claims that the external world objectively exists. The physical world and all the content we experience consists of the appearances of this external reality. This reality is one and undivided, the absolute. This leads to a traditional problem, however, the main problem for absolute idealism, the problem of the one and the many. How can we consistently maintain both that the one and undivided all encompassing absolute exists and that individual subjects exist? The decombination problem is a variant of exactly this problem. So this is the challenge. Adequately handling the problem of the one and the many, the decombination problem. In order to avoid this problem, it's 
helpful to take a look at the worldview of a Danish thinker, indeed a mystic, named Martinus. According to Martinus, fundamental reality itself is outside the realm of what we can directly experience. As in the absolute idealistic view, all we experience is the appearance of fundamental reality. But unlike in some variants of absolute idealism, in the worldview of Martinus, fundamental reality is not itself consciousness, but is that which possesses consciousness. And further, fundamental reality is one and undivided. It is the part of the Godhead, as he names it, that has experiences, is experiencing, existing as a self, as an I. And at the same time, it all, it's also each individual living being's experiencing part or self or I. Thus, Martinus upholds an all-encompassing unity of reality and the existence of individual subjects simultaneously. He illustrates the principle by which this is possible using the following metaphor. Imagine a bright light centered inside a hollow opaque sphere which has holes evenly distributed in its shell, allowing a ray of light to pass through each hole. The light represents reality, what is fundamental or real. The light inside the sphere represents the self or I, the experiencing part of the Godhead. The light of each ray represents the self or I, the experiencing part of an individual subject. The light of each ray branches out, but is not separated from the light in the center. And thus the Godhead and all individual living beings are ultimately, when it comes to their fundamental part, the one and indivisible fundamental reality, that which is. At the same time, however, the individual subjects represented as the individual race do exist. They exist because of the perforated shell. It represents the faculty of creating and experiencing. That is the fundamental metaphysical principle of experiencing as such. In this way, each living being is constituted by a triune principle. There is the substantive self, the I, which Martinus designates X1. It possesses the faculty of creating and experiencing X2. This in turn forms the bridge between fundamental or underlying reality and the world of phenomena or manifestation, X3. So the living being consists of that which experiences X1, that which allows for experience X2, and that which is experienced X3. This metaphor illustrates the triune principle quite well, but it might give the impression that the light of the rays X1 in the form of the cells or eyes of the individual living beings, and the light inside the sphere, X1 in the form of the self or I of the Godhead, are not identical. Both are X1 or fundamental reality, however. In addition to the perforated sphere image, Martinus offers another metaphor, which provides a slightly different illustration of this point. Let X1, the light in the previous image, be symbolized by a white disk and X2, previously the sphere, by a similar sized violet disk with many small holes and one large hole. If the violet disk is placed on top of the white disk, the white disk will still be visible through the holes. Thus the white disk representing X1 manifests itself through them. The appearance of the white disk through the small holes symbolizes the selves or eyes of the individual subjects, while the entire white disk, shown through the large hole, 
symbolizes the self or I of the Godhead, the entire cosmos. Every self or I is thus an expression of the same underlying fundamental reality, X1. Here we have the triune principle or triadic conception of the subject and of reality itself. It provides the contours of a possible solution to the decombination problem, the problem of the one and the many. The model that I now will outline can thus be termed triadic idealism. The starting point for the model is a premise which asserts two things. Quantitative substance monism, meaning that only a single and indivisible substance exists, and universal panpsychism, where every phenomenon that is experienced in the broadest sense is an appearance of the underlying fundamental reality, the one substance. While it is here presented merely as a premise, there are various arguments supporting this premise. It matches Sprick's well-argued views, for example. But once again, it takes at least a full video to do these arguments justice. <laughs> yes, I know, but I have said so three or four times. Now, but the subject matter is the nature of the entirety of reality after all, so there's some ground to cover. In this model, the way the subject is constituted involves three components, matching Martinus's triune principle. The term subject here refers to experiencing entities in the broadest sense, not merely subjects with human loving consciousness. Fundamental reality is understood as the substantive component of subjects. In terms of Martinus' sphere metaphor, the light in its entirety, that is, both the light in the center of the sphere and the light giving form to the rays, represents the one substance or the absolute, which is what has real or substantive existence, fundamental reality. The perforated shell symbolizes a fundamental metaphysical structure that constitutes and organizes experience and interaction. We'll name it the ICO structure, experience and interaction constituting and organizing structure. The light of each ray corresponds to the substantive component of <coughs> the individual subject. That part of the subject that has substantive existence, that is a part of the substance of fundamental reality. The individual subject in this entirety is likened to the ray as such. The light of the individual ray is a kind of branching out of the light inside the sphere, but is not separated from it. The light of the ray is simply the light within the sphere shining through the hole, that is, the individual substantive component of a subject is a part of the one substance. But at the same time, the subject possesses individuality in the sense that each ray of light is an individual ray. In short, each subject is an individual subject, but at the same time, each subject has a substantive component that is a part of the whole, a part of the one substance part of the one and undivided substantive reality. The light ray, the subject, is individuated by the perforated shell of the sphere, or if we move from the metaphor to the model, the subject is individuated by the icostructure. Unlike what the metaphor perhaps suggests, though this metaphysical structure is not ontologically independent of the one substance or separate from it. It's an imminent feature of it. Since experience as such factually exists, and since any experience requires contrast in the most fundamental sense, and since, as per the hypothesis, nothing exists substantially but the one substance, it follows that this substance is not quiet or structureless, but on the contrary, it features innumerable 
internal impulses. That is, the one substance is internally dynamic, continuously producing nuances within itself. These impulses can be interpreted as interactions between different parts of the substance. In this model, these parts are the substantive components of the individual subjects. And further, this interaction is what shows itself as experience. The concrete experiential content of consciousness is thus the manifestation or appearance of other parts of the one substance, that is, of the substantive parts of other subjects. So there's internal interaction within the one substance, and this interaction manifests as appearances, and its expression in the model of the metaphysical mechanism is the ICO structure. The ICO structure is thus inextricably linked to the principle of perspective as such, that which allows a center of experience to exist and allows any experience to have the accompanying inherent feeling of mindness. According to this model, the IQ structure is the metaphysical cause of perspective as such. It's the reason perspective per se exists. In a loose sense, it hardly is perspective. In this model, the subject is thus intrinsically linked to substantive reality, the one substance, but in such a way that it can meaningfully be understood to possess an individual substantive self, since it has its own discrete world of experience, its own perspective, it's a center of experience. The crucial element the model needs to account for the existence of the individual subject while holding that its substantive component is part of the one undivided substance is therefore a conceptual distinction between the subject as such, metaphorically the ray including the light of the ray, and its substance component, the light itself. It should be noted though that this is a conceptual distinction. The subject is one and undivided, but to understand its nature within the realm of theoretical models, analytic or conceptual distinctions are necessary to provide intelligible descriptions of the phenomenon in question. The individuality of these substantive components is thus intrinsically linked to centers of experience or instances of perspective. This is similar to Martinus' view. In this model, the individual subject can be understood as the manifestation of the particular part of the one substance that is linked to an instance of perspective or center of experience. That is, the substantive part is the substantive foundation or the metaphysical self or I, that which experiences of the individual subject. Or to put it another way, the subject can be analyzed as consisting of three components. Something that experiences and interacts, something that allows for experiencing or interacting, and the concrete experience itself in the form of the appearances of other parts of the one substance. So that which is experiencing this metaphysical self is the only part of the subject that is of actually substantive character and thus makes up the substantive component of the subject. Due to the IQ structure, the appearance of one subject is the experience of another subject and vice versa. In this sense, this metaphysical structure is constitutive not only for the individual subject's own experience, but also for other subjects' ability to experience that subject. It's therefore due to this structure that the sub substance can experience itself, or rather that parts of the substance can experience other parts of itself.
There's nothing substantive in existence other than the one substance, and thus nothing to experience other than the substance itself. It's in virtue of this metaphysical structure, the Ico structure, that the phenomenon of experience as such exists. So, every element of an experience expresses the underlying fundamental reality, the substance. Because every element of an experience is the appearance which some part of the substance has. We can posit an ultimate subject, the largest subject, whose appearance contains or is made up of all other appearances. This subject can only be the entire cosmos, and in line with the tradition of absolute idealism, this subject can be named the absolute subject, equivalent Martinus's Godhead. And thus, this model is cosmopsychistic in nature. Okay, to sum up, the suggested model is one of quantitative substance monism. That is, the only thing that exists substantively is one undivided substance. But the model nevertheless upholds the existence of individual subjects. This is possible due to the triadic conception of the subject. A substantive component which is a part of the one substance, an experience and interaction constituting an organizing metaphysical mechanism, the icostructure, and the sphere of experience. So what fundamentally exists substantively is the one undivided substance, and its particular internally dynamic inherent nature represented in the model by the IQ structure gives rise to individual subjects. It's important to note that in this model the substance is not simply consciousness, as is often the case in cosmopsychistic models. It is that which experiences, but experience as such, in the very broader sense, only exists due to the IQ structure. In that sense, consciousness arises in virtue of this structure. Hence, in this model, unlike some other cosmopsychistic models, there are individual subjects, but their subjectivity is not constituted in the subjectivity of a cosmic consciousness. Thereby, the difficult decombination problem is avoided. In addition, the main problems facing other metaphysical positions, such as the combination problem haunting most strands of panpsychism, or the troublesome problem of consciousness for physicalism, are not present in this model. A number of arguments can be raised against the model, though, not least concerning the positing of the IQ structure. The cosmopsychist models that explain human consciousness and subjectivity by simply positing an ontologically fundamental subjectivity, the cosmic consciousness, get what has been called a free lunch. The existence of consciousness or subjectivity simply does not have to be explained any further. There's no free lunch for the present model, however. Here it is instead suggested that a particular metaphysical mechanism or principle, the IQ structure, accounts for the subjectivity of the subject. This is a brute principle. It's simply claimed that reality is structured in this way without further explanation. The inclusion in the model of such a metaphysical structure without a direct empirical foundation can be criticized as being of purely speculative character. This is a shortcoming, but it is offset by an increased explanatory power regarding the difficult problems mentioned. After all, the achievement of explanation is a primary motivator of philosophical thinking. But in the end, it is a matter of which argument is considered most impactful, empirical grounding or explanatory power. It is evident that this model presents a view about the nature of reality that is rather 
unconventional compared to positions more in line with the mainstream views of contemporary philosophy. It is of a metaphysically idealistic and panpsychistic and even cosmopsychistic character. But even beyond that, it also potentially leads to new perspectives on a number of unsolved questions, such as the question of the subject's continual existence after physical death. Given acceptance of this model, it seems plausible that the subject does not perish by physical death but instead exists permanently since its metaphysical triadic structure is of a permanent character. Such considerations are beyond the scope of this video, however. Topic for another video yet again. So to conclude, the aim in this video has been to provide an outline of this proposed model for the fundamental nature of reality, triadic idealism, and to argue for its capacity to avoid the troublesome decombination problem, as well as key problems attached to other metaphysical positions. So the main strength of the model in this regard is the sheer number of deep problems it enables us to avoid. Thanks.